agile team-based organizations comes in many shapes. In this video, originally uploaded to another channel here on YouTube, a slightly younger version of myself explores how such an organization can look like, and how you get there. You could argue that an organization can be described by the processes and structures that define how people interact. I will make an attempt to show you how this could look like in an agile team-based organization. For me, that is best done by starting to comparing it to a traditional top-down hierarchical organization. The following is of course an oversimplification, but let this pyramid symbolize the organization. Let's start with all the people that do actual value-adding work. They create products and provide services to customers and users. They are the craftsmen transforming ideas to something that can be delivered, that is useful and valuable, which eventually brings us profit and growth. At the top of the pyramid, we have a small group of people who are in charge of the company and responsible for the overall success. Sometimes they decide to do this from an inaccessible top floor with the best views to the outer world. They live under the strong belief that for us to be successful, we need to be able to make smart decisions and be in control. It's a hard job, but that's what we've been hired to do. Besides, how could possibly the individual worker have a good enough overview perspective to make smart decisions? So, in order for us to be successful, we provide structure, guidance and focus to our workers by making tough decisions and enforcing policies and processes. To help the few at the top to reach everyone and to manage all the work, we have managers and middle managers. Through budgets, the managers are delegated power and influence, and by imposing deadlines and only providing information on a need-to-know basis, the organization ensures that people are focused on the projects they are working on without being distracted. In order for the few in charge to be able to make smart decisions, they continuously gather status reports and collect data. To achieve and maintain control, they demand clear parts of accountability. And in order for them to quickly get insights into how things are progressing, reports, processes and tools are standardized. There might be thousands of people in the organization, but the needs of the few drives standardization, even when it's neither needed nor helpful for the people doing the actual work. Furthermore, to maintain control, a lot of bureaucracy is often introduced. The need to quickly understand the progress and status also drives simplification and abstraction. For a few to understand and control something as complex as an organization, the information needs to be simplified and abstracted. But reducing reports to one-liners, project progress to green, yellow, red, and adding more manager layers to reduce the number of interactions creates even more distance between the few and reality. This results in decisions not anchored in reality nor solving real problems. Insights into real problems and opportunities become obscured by this simplification and abstraction of information. If the organization has been down this path for a few decades, you will have created processes and structures that makes life easier for the few at the top. You will probably not end up in an organization adopted for helping great people do great work, achieving great results. The structures that managers reside within have a tendency to grow. Some research claim with as much as 11% per year. The processes and bureaucracy was probably added to solve a real problem. But the structures, with its people within, have a tendency to grow a life of their own and solidify, even long after the problem has been solved. Okay, so how does an agile, team-based organization differ? In an agile organization, we have the same great people. We have all those doing actual value-adding work, but instead of being spread thin, staffed into projects governed by budgets, they organize themselves in teams. The teams are long-lived. Their work might vary over time, but the work is always aligned with their mission. A mission could be to cater for the needs of a specific market or user group, or develop and maintain a product, or provide an internal service, and so on. An Agile team has a couple of properties. The team is cross-functional, which means that the members together have all the competences needed to execute on their mission, to transform an idea into something that can be delivered to their customers. An Agile team is co-located, which means that they sit physically together to maximize communication and collaboration. Members are fully dedicated to the team 100%, no other competing commitments. Agile teams are stable. It takes time for a team to become strong and high-performing. Frequently shuffling people around undermines this. An Agile team is autonomous. They decide together how to work, how to solve problems, who works with whom, and in which order work is done. Within the boundaries of their mission, they need to figure out the best strategy to reach their goals. 
They own and shape their own processes and they have a collective responsibility for the quality of the products and services they deliver. We also have the few at the top, responsible for the overall success. In an agile organization with an agile culture and mindset, these people however believe that for the teams to succeed, they need us to provide clear guidance and support. Each team governs themselves and makes decisions on a daily basis. For them to be able to do this, they need to know what the overall vision is so that they can align their own plan to the overarching goals. What are the top priorities? What are our top challenges? To make good decisions without resorting to gut feelings and chance, teams need access to information and context. This is usually achieved through transparency. To be able to resolve their own problems, people and teams are given empowerment and trust. Trust in that they want to do a great job, are doing their best, and that they approach work and problems responsibly. The manager's and middle manager's job is to support the teams with all of this. They are there to help the teams be successful. They provide feedback and guidance when teams request it. It could be feedback on deliverables or guidance when they have multiple options in their roadmap. When a team can't resolve an impediment because it's beyond their area of influence, they request help. When they need support, they turn to the managers. Teams might request all kinds of support. It could be approval to purchase new systems or invest in tools. It could be work environment related, new shares, whiteboards, uh, noise cancellation headphones, or maybe plants to make the team room nicer. Perhaps they have learned that they need training to be able to tackle their next challenge. Sometimes they might even ask for protection, help keeping greedy stakeholders or disturbing intruders away so they can focus on what's important. Teams will also ask for help to establish dialogue with other people. They might ask for help to get connected with other teams they are depending on. Quite often, they need to get hold on stakeholders to understand their needs. Establish a dialogue with customers and users is also vital for the team to get feedback on what they deliver. Also, relationship and expectation management with external partners can be tricky and complicated. This is, however, only the start. An agile organization takes a couple of more steps. In an agile organization, the managers and middle managers don't reside on a separate floor. They are not disconnected from the teams. To be able to provide support and close active leadership, they live and work among the teams. To understand the needs of the teams, they sit next to them and listen in on meetings and discussions. Furthermore, the top managers don't regard themselves as being on top, governing everyone beneath them. They also provide support, but in a different shape. They work with improving the overall health of the system and providing clear guidance on priorities. For a team to do a truly great job, we can't even stop here. As I've already stated, a team is responsible for figuring out how to best execute on their mission and they are being held responsible for quality end to end. Because of this, we make sure to connect the team with their customers and users so they can truly understand their needs and pains. And end-to-end -end responsibility also entails that the teams deliver to whatever platform or client those customers and users are using. To enable rapid learning, we invest in establishing feedback loops. We want to learn quickly if the things we build are of high quality, if automated tests fail when we make changes, and if we are progressing fast enough or if we need to reduce scope. We also make sure to continuously learn what the users think about the product. Is it solving their problem? Are we reaching the desired impact? If not, we rethink and reprioritize. The example so far has depicted a company with three teams. Well, what if we have 50 teams? How does this scale? Big agile team-based organization, as any big company, is usually divided into organizational units, such as departments or similar entities. Each department tends to be smaller than 150 people. However, departments doesn't split people by competence or systems. The teams, they stay intact. Common strategies are to group teams that belong to the same value stream or work in the same product family in one department. Another strategy is to group teams that have the most dependencies between each other close together. Even if we have autonomous teams that rapidly deliver value to customers, we still need to align on a couple of long-term strategies. If everyone runs in their own direction, we soon end up in a state of confusion, conflicts and incoherent product strategies. One possible approach to deal with this is to create forums. One forum could discuss and decide upon long-term architecture strategy, another forum might work on improving the joint delivery process, and one forum could have decision power regarding long-term work environment and seating questions. Each forum consists of elected representatives from each team, as well as manager representatives, ensuring that all perspectives are included in the dialogue. 
The forums have mandate to decide within their area. And if you want to influence a long-term strategy, well, then you engage in that forum. Finally, not only do Agile team launch from short and frequent feedback loops, they also need to learn from each other as well as synchronize plans with other teams. For example, the Java developers probably meet frequently in something called a community of practice to learn from each other and to share knowledge and experience. Two or more teams might be working on the same project for a limited set of time, thus introducing the need for synchronization and collaboration. Perhaps there is a group of people responsible for the long-term health of a development framework. They would get together to plan and discuss upcoming work. Replacing bureaucracy and slow processes with fast autonomous teams doesn't come for free. The oil that makes the engine run is communication. Lots of communication. With that said, I now wrap up this introduction to how an agile organization could be structured. I hope I answered some of your questions and managed to bring clarity to how it works under the hood and a glimpse of the journey on how to get there. Thank you for watching to the end of this video. What did you make of my way of describing the journey from a pyramid to an agile team-based organization? Please share your thoughts and personal experiences in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and colleagues. If you're curious to learn more, perhaps you'll enjoy this video about Lean and Flow. Until next time, explore, have fun, and be safe.